scripture, the second scripture reading comes in two parts. The first is from John 11, verses 32 to 36. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. And the second part of the reading comes from Matthew 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The word of God for the people of God. John 11, 32 to 36, which Carol just read, uh, says Jesus began to weep in, in our NRSV, and the, uh, the King James Version it says simply Jesus wept, and it is noted to be the shortest verse in the Bible. Don't know if in the other translations it's the shortest or not. I don't know if there's any that's got four, other ones got four words or three words, but as, as of two, it's the shortest verse, but it, but it says a lot. It teaches us a lot. Uh, Jesus began to weep. Uh, so there is very, I think there's very some, some significance to the fact that Jesus began to weep or Jesus wept. In our beatitude for today, we see where Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. So let's look together and see why we are blessed if we mourn. Let's pray. <laughs> God, we thank you for the songs, the messages of them, the prayers, the scripture readings that we've already heard for your, for your spirit that's been present with us this morning already. Now, as we look into your word, we pray that you'd open our hearts, our minds, and our ears, give us understanding, help us to get from your word what you have for us, Lord. We all have individual needs. You know what those need, so let your spirit speak to each of us with the message that each of us needs to hear today. Let me be your mouthpiece to share the things you have to share in the way that you have to share. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So let's look at the meaning of the word mourn, as we uh, have been doing in the other messages in this, this series. The, the Greek word is, is pronounced pentheo. It literally means to mourn for the dead. And the scripture reading that we heard first uh, today from Genesis 37, 23 to 35 uh, it, it, it's the story of, of uh, Joseph being thrown in a pit and being uh, sewed and his brothers taking uh, his coat and putting animal's blood on it and taking it back to his father. And uh, Jacob loved Joseph and thought of his death, that, that his death was almost more than he could bear. And that same word, when it was translated to the Greek, is the same word that's used to describe that grief that, that Joseph felt, or that Jacob felt. It says he mourned for his son. It's that same word that, that Jesus uses here. He says, blessed are those who mourn. He, he feared that, that Joseph had been killed by animals and he, he mourned deeply. Uh, it's a very heartfelt, very deep mourning. It's more than, oh, I'm sorry, you know, on top of a grief, but it's, but it's a deep, heartfelt sorrow. Uh, like like Jacob would have felt for Joseph. So how does this apply to our lives today? I think there's three types of mourning that we can say that this applies to. First of all, obviously, when we've lost to death those closest to us, that would be one very close to what happened with, with Jacob here. He thought he had lost Joseph. The loss of a mate or a child or a tra to a tra tragic death or, or someone's very close has got to hurt very deeply. But to this, Deep hurt comes a promise, for they will be comforted. Uh, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There are some points we need to remember when, when tragedy strikes. First of all, don't blame God. You know, God isn't what, God didn't want people to be puppets on strings, so he created people with free will. You know, when God, in the, in the beginning, uh, with that free will, people made choices that brought sickness and death 
into the picture. You know, that's what the first stories of, of, of Genesis, I think, tells us. God wanted it to be a perfect world, but by our choices, death and sickness came into the world. That same God didn't want to leave. This is the Hebrew understanding of the God that we have. That same God didn't want to leave people in this state either, so God sent Christ to provide a way that we can be put back in that beautiful relationship that God intended for us at the beginning, where there will be no hurt or sickness or death anymore in, in heaven. But secondly, as we think about mourning, uh, don't blame ourselves. You know, it's, we can't, there's no need to blame ourselves. There are so many factors involved in death, and we probably didn't cause all of them. Uh, we probably didn't control all of them. Taking on the blame ourselves doesn't help anyone. It just destroys us. So, so that's the second thing I think about mourning someone that we've lost deeply, uh, that we love. Thirdly, concentrate and letting God put it back together. Let God bring that comfort for those who mourn will be comforted. Let God put it back together. With God's help, count the things that we still got. Don't dwell on what we've lost. But think about what we still got. Italian philosophy poem from Robert Schuller's the, the Be Happy Attitudes, which is about the Beatitudes. He says, he, he quotes this poem. Count your garden by the flowers, never by the leaves that fall. Count your days by golden hours, don't remember clouds at all. Count your nights by stars, not shadows. Count your life with smiles, not tears. And your joy, and with joy on every birthday, count your age by friends, not years. Realize that grief can, can make us bitter, or it can make us better. Let God help make us better. God wants to. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that all things work together for good to them who love the Lord. Let God work it together for your good. Let God bring some good out of it for you. There are a lot of ways God brings good from bad situations, but one thing God can always bring from every situation, if we will let God, God can use us to help someone else in a similar situation to get through that. One of my college professors, Dr. Larry Crowe, uh, lost a daughter in a tragic car wreck. He, he recalled that to us one time during class. He, he talked of going through a time of mourning and missing her greatly. Then one day, he determined to give it to God and let God bring something good out of it for him. And he said that God had helped him, and now he felt that he was in a situation to, to help someone else go through a similar time. That was something positive that, that God had, had helped come from her death. And help bring out of her death. He got very passionate talking about God's grace through those times and how God had brought him through it and, and uh, how God was using him to help other people uh, in similar situations. So that's something that God can bring good out of the worst situations if we will let God do that. And there, there, I'm sure there are other ways, other things that God can bring out of good out of the bad that happens to us. So that we yield to God and remember and do these things, God will bring us that comfort that we need. As it says, they shall be comforted. A second type of mourning I think this applies to is when we see the hurt or the injustice of others. When someone else is hurt or somebody, something is being done unjustly to someone else. Um, so two ways we can mourn for others when we see their hurt. You know, this could be uh, mourning with them at the loss, if they have a loss of a loved one, or so when some tragedy has struck them, we can hurt with them. Also, when we see that an injustice is being done to them because of someone's unthoughtfulness or someone's sin toward them. Our world today says, don't get involved. You know, that's what we're told, what's kind of pounded into our head. Don't get involved. This has crept into our churches. And somehow we sometimes fail to let our emotions and our heart get involved with the hurt of others. You know, and that, just to this, um, this beatitude tells us, you know, blessed are those who mourn, who hurt with other people. This goes against the teachings of the Bible. Every once in a while we see where someone really steps up to the plate and does something because they are mourning 
for the hurt and the injustice of others. Our bishop has, has a passion to lead us toward anti-racism -racism wherever we see it. And he posts articles about it. And, and sometimes I forward him on, but he, he posts articles about it. He puts them on Facebook. He has imp implemented change in our conference to help with that. You know, sometimes it's popular when someone mourns for the injustice of others and, and tries to do something about it, but sometimes it is not. Probably most of the time, it is not uh, the most popular thing. And so I think our bishop has probably taken some flack over that, even. So who do you know who needs an advocate? Who needs someone to hurt with them? You know, this beatitude calls us to ask ourselves that thing. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. When we get involved and mourn for others, this moves us to action. We find comfort in the fact that we've done what we could. We have done what we could. We've let God use us. The third way we should mourn, I think, is, is that our own sin and shortcomings, probably how it affects other people as well. The way to become a Christian is through repentance, and that begins with sorrow for sin and realization of our need for God, which kind of gets back into the last week's message where the you know, poor in spirit realizing our need for God. After we become a Christian, when we fail, when we fall short, when we fall short of God's love and how, in, in the way we treat people, we should still feel this sorrow for sin. This mourning or sorrow for sin moves us to repentance. And when we get to this place, we find comfort in the hands of a loving and forgiving God. So blessed is the person who suffers hurt because of a tragic loss. This beatitude speaks of that. For they will be comforted. God will give them what they need. God will help them through that time. God will help them to be better and not bitter. God will, help, God, God will use them to help other people, bring something good out of it for them. And blessed are those who mourn at the pain or the injustice of others, for they will be comforted as well. So how long has it been since we've mourned at the pain or injustice in the life of another? We've been, we've been really touched by that and hurt by that. I think that this little short scripture, Jesus wept, gives us a, an insight into the mind of God. God hurts with us, and as God's people, we are to hurt with other people. We are to mourn with other people. Pray that God would help us have a loving, caring, and concerned heart. And blessed are those who mourn over their sin and their lack of love. How long has it been since we mourned over our own sin and our lack of love, and we have fretted over how we did not show love? This passage of Scripture says when we do, and we mourn because of that, and we hurt because of that. We shall be comforted. We shall find forgiveness. Jesus wept because he hurt with others. That's the kind of God we have. Mourning for others is a godly virtue. Mourning for others is a godly virtue. That's that part of God living through us. So as we encounter Christ in communion today, allow God to help you to grow in this godlike, quality. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you uh, for this scripture, and we thank you that this teaching that you gave us uh, on, in your Sermon on the Mount. And we pray, Lord, that you'd forgive us for the ways that we have not mourned for others, that we've not bestowed this godlike virtue in our lives. Forgive us, uh, free us to be more like you, to be more godlike in the future to mourn at the hurt of others, to mourn even in, in our own hurt, and to know that you will bring us the comfort we need. And as we realize our sin and we mourn at that, that you will help us to, to be better and to more uh, glorify you, more be like you, more godlike. As we go forth today, let us represent you well and share your love to everyone we come in contact with. For to Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the Lord's table. It's not just the United Methodist table. And that means that if you're here and you're not a member of the church, you can still, if God's speaking to you, you can still partake.
uh, it's not just for us. You know, it's in, in, uh, if, you, if you've never made a commitment to God before, we believe that you can, can make a commitment to God as you pertain to these elements physically, that God can be speaking to you and you can be answering that call spiritually. You can be encountering God as you take in these elements. You can be encountering God spiritually for whatever you need. And we pray for that as we consecrate the elements this morning, that God will be present, that God will meet the needs that are here, that this will be a real spiritual encounter. It's kind of what makes our beliefs about communion a little different than some other traditions. You know, we're expecting God to do something. So if God's speaking to you and wanting to do something for you, you're invited to come up and, and join us today and take your take with us. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news, Christ died for us while we have sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. And to the great thanksgiving, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image, breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day. When justice shall run down like waters, and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they burn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their ending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of fire and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sin and reign with you at your right hand. On the night which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and broke it and blessed it. He said, Take eat, this is my body that's given for you. As often as you take it, take it remembrance of me. And you'll find it under the, the, the top clear rack on the top of this. As you take the bread, remember the life of Christ. That he lived among us in his body, the life of God with us, as he as he came and lived among us and, and incarnated in Jesus Christ. And then he took the cup and he drank it and he and he blessed it and, and said, Drink this, this is my blood in the cup, and pour out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. So as you take the cup, remember, you know, it, it represents for us Christ's blood, which means it represents Christ's death for us. God did for us what we can't do for ourselves so we can be forgiven and given a new chance to live for God and to represent God and to love as God loves in the world. So as you take the cup, remember that. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ, offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's pray. For us, your Holy Spirit, when us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ. Redeemed.
redeemed by his blood. Be present at our table, Lord, for whatever needs are here today. If it's for that first time of commitment, we pray for your presence to do that and to forgive. If it's for rededication, for help to, to be uh, more sensitive to other people's needs and to, and to, to mourn with other people, uh, to, to think more of others and less of ourselves, be present, Lord, uh, to help us to, to do that and to be forgiven for the ways that we failed you in the past and be given a new chance to live for you closer than we have in the future than we have in the past. So by your spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, till Christ comes in final victory and we feast in his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let's pray the prayer of the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.